come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thank you for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, especially during the spooky season. This is our favorite time of year. We're a movie review podcast that comes your way every Saturday. We uh, hope that you'll, wherever you found us, go over there and hit that like, subscribe button. Uh, give us a review. All of that stuff helps us get found through the uh, rise, through the algorithms, and uh, helps us get discovered by other folks like you who are into the same awesome stuff that we are. Uh, these are the internet radio superstars. Holly. Michaela. John. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by Colin. Colin, it's the spooky season. What did you pick as your spooky season pick? Uh, tonight we went with a classic, uh, sp- a chiller, right? Chiller theater Ooh. kind of movie. Uh, we watched The Haunted Palace. Uh, directed by Roger Corman. Ooh, um, from the year. A 1963. Um, okay. Right? So. I mean, but this is the thing. I mean, like we've had, we've talked about Roger Corman on, on this show before, mm. but I mean, when you hear the name Roger Corman I and mean, what, I mean, what is your go-to, what's the mental you know image that you have for like, what kind of movies he makes? Cheap. <laughs> Cheap. Human Cheap noise is fun. a deep. Cheap yeah. Fun. <laughs> well, that's, you know, I mean, that's always been kind of the way that I've thought of the man, to be honest with you, is that Roger Corman's the guy who's a producer of like extreme. I mean, he's the guy who's like uh, responsible for like Gatoroid, right? I mean, stuff yeah. like that in a later day uh, and really cheap, um, you know, because I mean, his whole thing was basically like, you know, if we're renting a location for. X number of weeks in Italy. Well, then we're going to, we're going to make two movies while we're there. I was going to say, we're going to shoot five <laughs> movies while we're there and just knock it out. Yeah. And he gave a lot of, uh, upcoming filmmakers, including like Francis Ford Coppola and, uh, and Jonathan Demi and, you know, others, uh, their starts by basic and James Cameron and all these people. Um, because, uh, I mean, he would like allow first time directors to try their stuff, you know, because it was just like, yeah, here, make a movie, come up with something, you know, in five days. And you know, I mean, it was trial by fire. Um, but even though that's how I remember him, it's like his his actual name really got started with uh, the series of um, Edgar Allan Poe adaptations that he did in the 50s and 60s uh, that were critically acclaimed. He had done stuff. He had done, done cheap movies before this, mostly like uh, – bikini movies uh biker movies uh you know those kind of um exploitation things and he did like bucket of blood which launched dick miller and uh he did little shop of horrors wasp woman i mean all that kind of stuff but in this in the late 50s i guess he was given the opportunity to go to american international pictures and uh he said you know hey instead of um you know spending uh this much money on this movie why don't you give me the budget of two movies we'll shoot in color and we'll make it like a thing and we'll do like an Edgar Allan Poe, uh, you know, like a serious artistic, you know, inspired Question. by. Yeah. Did he also do Mask of the Red Death? Yes. All of these. Yeah. Okay. He did, he did all, them all. all of them. Okay. Well, the Vincent Price ones where it's just all the Edgar Allan Poe stuff. Yeah. There's a series of uh, eight in total in that series. Oh, wow. uh, have you seen any of those? Um, No. I, I've been hearing a lot about Mask of the Red Death lately just because of them. Uh, Vincent Price collection and all that stuff coming out, but I have not seen them. Yeah, that set, that that Shout Factory set, they just reissued it. Uh, this movie that we watched tonight was a part of it, but um, that, like, that, the, you know, it's like we say, like, well, is there a demand for this kind of stuff? It's like that set now, the original version retails, you know, it goes for on eBay for like several hundred dollars, <laughs> you know? It's like, because uh, they had these um, introductions that he shot for like a PBS, uh, you know, like a um, Iowa PBS where you'd introduce all the movies <laughs> and they got those and put them on the front of them. And then they lost the license. And so now Nothing they've says entertainment like, like Iowa PBS. Yeah. They flew him. They flew him out like in the eighties to sit in like an old Gothic <laughs> mansion and introduce all of his movies. It's like, it's just so cool. <laughs> some managers like looking at the budget going, get me Vincent price. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> but that kind of blows my mind, right? That like a right? PBS station would have the that's ability like, to that's like Rockford flying someone in and being like, yeah, what really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The um, well, Vincent Price. I mean, he's the star of this, and uh, um, obviously, he's been on the Saturday Night Freak Show several times before. This is his fourth appearance. Uh, Vincent Price is a Hall of Famer. He was in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, right? He was at the end. He was the uh, voice of the Invisible Man. Uh, he was right. in. Uh, we did House of Wax, um, and we did Dead Heat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez! When she appeared, in- forgot but about Dead Heat. I'm I, see. This is what I'm thinking. It's like Vincent Price is one of the titans of the horror genre because, like, he is a superstar of horror movies, right? Mm. Where when you're thinking of like superstars of horror, I mean, uh, you know, who do you have? I mean, like a superstar, someone who only well, does horror well, movies when? primarily uh, throughout history. I mean, because I think it was, uh, all right, I'm going to make a, a claim here that I don't know if I can back up, but it, it, to me, it's like there's Boris Karloff. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's my first one. Because he was a, like, he ran on that image you know, of being the scary guy uh, in Hollywood and, you know, ended up doing, you know, when you're selling products as like, you know, Boris Karloff or Vincent Price is selling, you know, whatever American Express, you know, (laughs) yeah, he's going to, it's going to be a creepy American (laughs) Express commercial. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be horror. I remember when he was uh, selling American Express. Yeah, he did. Because they were all in like a gothic mansion and like, I never leave home without it. And uh, don't leave home without it. He had the one for like, I don't know if it was Tylex or something that, you know, like for for fighting mildew and all that on your, you know, in your bathroom you know okay we need we need more commercials like that <laughs> Can we do it, right it should be one of him doing like a windex commercial for cleaning yeah mirrors these exist and shit you, you I, can yeah. find i vote for that shit every time <laughs> I, I like i will buy anything if it's like slightly spooky yeah. you is know like a, is it like a fucking bella lugosi for mop and glow like i want to see that shit yeah well are you yeah. guys familiar are you guys familiar with the shark tank product scrub daddy no so it's like it's this uh, maybe it's this specialized like scrubbing sponge whatever I'm not going to give the pitch for it but they, <laughs> please do but they came out with a Halloween set where the sponge they have a pumpkin sponge a Frankenstein sponge and like I think a skull sponge or something I bought it because I was like yeah, <laughs> Halloween sponges from my kitchen why the hell yeah. not it's true <laughs> I didn't buy the regular one but I bought the Halloween three pack why not well, that's what you got it yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if they brought uh, 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 they bring back uh, actors back from the dead, and they've been doing it uh, uh, lately. If they brought Vincent Price back to hawk products, I'd be all for it. Even if it was yeah. just during the month of October, yeah, it's like bring it back to to hawk me some McDonald's or something. Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. We got to look this up because they're on YouTube. I mean, I have seen several of the things that he was a pitch man for. Um, right. But, you know, I mean, by the time Boris Karloff was doing like, you know, how the Grinch stole Christmas and stuff like that, I mean, you've tr- transcended, right? Somehow the the genre until like you you represent the genre. You know, I remember uh, this is a thing in doing the research from this. You know, Vincent Price he obviously starred with Boris Karloff in several of the um, Roger Corman movies. I think they were in The Raven. I think they were in one more comedy of terrors or whatever. Um, but they were talking about basically the fact that like, you know, Boris Karloff was this guy who was always known for horror movies. And like, you know, it's like, could he do anything else, you know? And is this kind of the career that you had in mind when you started off acting and all that kind of stuff? And uh, Boris Karloff, I guess, told him, he's like, uh, you know, he's, I had that kind of, you know, sense about myself. But then at some point you become aware that like, you know, Gary Cooper can't do what I do. Uh, you know, Cary Grant can't do what I do. It's like, I am, even though it's like, Oh, you're the scary guy. It's like, but that's something that only I can do. And I think, that's you know, true. uh, Vincent Price also <laughs> kind of adopted that sense about himself, you know, cause he was a guy who started off in theater and doing stuff like dragon wick and all this other, but he, uh, really became like a horror star, um, after house of wax, but I guess it was mask of the red death became like this huge phenomenal uh or no sorry it was uh follow the house of usher that was the first one yeah. it became this like huge phenomenal hit and it basically established him as you know 
he is the reigning king of uh, horror. He had done House on Haunted Hill and Last Man on Earth and stuff like that before before that, but uh, that was like really cemented the deal for him. I was going to say Robert Englund was like maybe the last like horror superstar, but is that was Freddy Krueger, you know, because he was a pitch man too for like all sorts of fucking you know one eight hundred numbers and <laughs> albums, and, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. MTV Freddy was a big thing. Yeah, right. So true. Like, is there anybody who's done that since that's been primarily a horror, you know, only known for horror? You know, yeah. Someone who could pop up in a commercial and be like, "Holy shit!" Yeah. I'm I'm Mike Flanagan. That doesn't work nowadays. I mean, Rob Zombie gets to direct uh, Tide commercials. I saw his Tide <laughs> commercial or whatever and <laughs> stuff like that. I, I think horror is not respected now the way it was even like 20 to 30 years ago. So I I think that's why it doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, um, this movie that we're talking about, The Haunted Palace, uh, is part of the Edgar Allan Poe cycle, but that's not entirely... True. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to say that this movie is basically the it's, the, it's the distillation of Colin. Like, I feel like Colin came from this movie. Like this movie, because this, Absolutely. I feel like it birthed you because this is pretty much just everything right up your alley. We got Vincent Price. We've got Edgar Allan Poe. We've got, uh, 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 what's Lovecraft. his name? Lovecraft. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft. We've got Lon Chaney. Uh, we ah, man, this foggy is foggy graveyards. Like I was gonna say foggy lots graveyards, of <laughs> torches, castles, uh, and candelabras. Right, burnings at the stake. This is this is Colin. <laughs> this movie is Colin. Sure. I'm, I'm I wouldn't be surprised. I, Colin, I'm pretty sure you would just want to like your way to go out of this world would be in a dark castle killed by ghosts. No, like a absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think this is how you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Creeping like around with the you. candelabras. You have yes. to, you know, and through the gloom, I could do without the spiders. Yes. Spider webs are okay. As long as, you know, but, uh, <laughs> and do you yeah, want your spirit you. to be trapped in a haunted painting? Yes. So you can control he does. Your <laughs> this is, this is Colin's soul. <laughs> <laughs> this movie. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if we burn this movie, Colin dies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well it's uh it's a so but but he so the, it's sold as an edgar Allan poe um story but it's yeah. actually an hp lovecraft story this is as far as i can tell the first uh time hp lovecraft was adapted for uh the screen this is the yeah. first time that you were hear the word cthulhu mentioned in a movie in 1963. <laughs> I know. I heard it. I was just like, whoa, that's, did you know, it was, me off a little did bit. you catch that it was HP Lovecraft though? At the- I, I, I saw that, but I'm always, it's always weird when something this early, which is weird. Cause you know, uh, HP Lovecraft is, uh, I don't know how many years old, he was like twenties like, and thirties. Yeah. Twenties yeah, and thirties. Yeah. So even though it makes sense, hearing that name from this early in a movie is always weird to me. Yeah. Even though I think they mispronounce it. How do you pronounce the name? With, Did they say Thulu? He said Thulu. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's always Cthulhu to me. I mean, I'll pronounce it that way till forever. Yeah, that's how I've always said it. Same yeah. way, Sean. Yeah. I heard, uh, you know, some because I, I don't know, even, I don't know, like, you know, like um, J.R.R. Tolkien, right? Uh, well, J.R.R. Tolkien left like a, um, not the bibliography. What am I talking about? He left like, the pronunciation key. For all of his, you know, weird elvish, uh, you know. <laughs> That's words. what I was just going to say. They're going to find that for this guy, and it's going to be like, Thulu. And you guys are all going to yeah. be fucked up. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, oh, damn it, we've been doing it wrong. Son of a bitch, Thulu? What the hell is that? Well, it's supposedly, Thulu. it's a it's an alien sound. It's this alien being and creature. And this is the closest that a human uh vocal cord can get to uh to making that sound so it's like almost you know or something <laughs> Fucked up. now you sound like the dude from episode one <laughs> right. you sound like a gungan is what you sound like yeah <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, H.P. Lovecraft, for those of you who don't know, come on, everybody knows, right? If you're listening to this show, you know that this man has a uh, long-lasting legacy in the horror genre because primarily, even though he was uh, mostly a writer of uh, the quote-unquote weird tale, uh, published in magazines and novel uh, you know, short stories. He was basically, to me, I think, maybe like the Stephen King of uh, the 1930s and uh, or 20s and 30s, right? Um, yep. But he came up with a, like, I, mean, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like a cosmology of, uh, you know, um, this, these warring races of, um, alien beings that basically accidentally created humankind, uh, in there, you know, they're the cosmic horror, the stuff that just blows your mind, you know, whenever human beings come in contact with the, the awesome void of, you know, or, uh, you know, the, the, the extraterrestrial, uh, intelligence, there's the elder gods, and the deep ones who are always at war and somewhere slumbering beneath the surface of the earth, waiting for their chance to, you know, when the stars align again and black magic is right or whatever, that they can right. take the place back over again. And they're transmitting their, uh, their thoughts, you know, into uh, and shaping, you know, the things that we think about unknowingly. Um, that stuff is like really fucking cool to me. I don't know. It's just always been one of those cool things. They've spun that off into role playing games and they've made adaptations yeah. all throughout um, the two stories. Probably, if you want to get like the gist of the uh, the Lovecraft cosmology, are Call of Cthulhu and At the Mountains of Madness would be the two to read. But this movie is based on a story called The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. You may have heard that of sounds it. very familiar, Colin. Have we? <laughs> heard of the story before uh does it seem yeah. familiar several years ago uh, how so we watched a movie called the resurrected which uh we starred uh, christopher sarandon um that was a dan o'bannon movie and that was like a more you know i mean it was still loose but it was a more literal adaptation of the story what it point, was indeed sean holly was here for this too weren't you did you watch the resurrected Res- uh, Chris Remind Sarandon, <laughs> there's a house, there's a there's deep, dark basement with monsters in it. He starts, I mean, it's basically, there's a painting, I believe. He starts turning into his ancestor. It's really so. dark and... Yeah, it's yeah. a detective. Yeah, it's like I, a detective movie. Yeah. yeah, I think I was there for it. Yeah, because... Now, Colin, uh, uh, I don't, I don't enjoy calling you out. Um, we did, I, I discovered a little something tonight um, <laughs> that... <laughs> piqued my interest. Now you picked the resurrected years ago. Years ago. Um, how many? What? What? How many theaters did the resurrected like get to in its run? <laughs> ballpark. <laughs> ballpark it for me. I just just give me a number. Well, okay. What I'm guessing on the, I, but the story. What I believe is that it was. Uh, you know, we talked about the uh, the. It was made. <laughs> the movie was made, then the company went bankrupt, so it came out on. VHS. So the the answer I think you're looking for almost like is zero. That's right. It's just like it went directly. Yeah. To VHS. Kind of like, what we're saying. like Mean Guns or something like so, that. That right. Yeah. So okay. I just want to <laughs> just want to put that out there. No reason. I just want to clarify that. But it's not made for video. Not oh, made doesn't for matter. television. Doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Doesn't matter. Absolutely. Totally. Doesn't amazing. matter. Doesn't you, matter. No. You said before theatrical release those were your words and it did not have one it probably played in a film festival and now we gotta go one. check it out it's not theatrical release no God. no okay i just that's all that's all i wanted i didn't we don't have to go any further than that i just want to <laughs> i just want to present the facts and let our listeners decide i would like to right point out wrong. that even i would like to point out that even uh past episode the fanatic got a theatrical release so <laughs> the oh, defense sure. rests <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh yes but yes continue let's, uh, let's move well, on well if okay so the the actual story um then that, that we're talking about uh is about a guy well it's actually told from the dr willett uh, character uh the actual story oh, he okay. finds these letters and tries to figure out what happened because there was this guy a medical student named charles dexter ward who um became obsessed after he inherited a family house and he found this trunk of stuff and he starts reading all this crap about his ancestor which is joseph Kerwin, and then 
Dexter Ward starts going weird and they put him in a mental institution and it turns out what actually happened. I'm going to ruin the story here for you. This is what happened. Uh, he conjures somehow the, his ancestor, who's a warlock, who's trying to do all these experiments. And basically, like, the 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 ancestor, Kerwin, looks just like Ward, so he takes his place, kills Ward, and then tries to pretend to be him. But because he's an old-timey dude, right, from uh, the Salem witch era, <laughs> uh, he gets locked in a mental institution and is still trying to, you know, put the zap on people. <laughs> <laughs> uh question was this i could be confusing it with another story was this only told in letter form in the story like is he just reading the letters yeah that's pretty much okay. every how lovecraft you know it's always somebody, right, yeah. it's like a letters within a letter within a letter like i was doing right. this and then i found this letter and here's this account and then that guy found something here's that account that he yeah um yeah. Okay. So this one is a, uh, it's a, it's a loose adaptation and it also kind of, and this is maybe why it's of interest is because it kind of takes in, um, elements from other HP Lovecraft mythos, um, including like, uh, there's a heavy influence of like the shadow over Innsmouth in this, which if you've seen the movie Dagon, the Stuart Gordon movie Dagon was based on shadow over Innsmouth. But the idea that, you know, in a coastal town that's forbidden somewhere on the, uh, you know, New, New England coast, um, well, uh, specifically Arkham in this movie, right? Uh, there's been this right. in interbreeding, generational interbreeding between humans and these the deep old ones uh, that have produced like these half alien, half human uh, offspring, right? This is part of the plan to you know, take the universe or the, the planet back over again um slowly but surely just by one by one birth by one birth yeah but they're doing it so much i guess i i don't know it's a, yeah it's a <laughs> okay at, at, is there a queen at, laying eggs somewhere at what point do they talk about all this because I, I i missed i missed all this um in the haunted pal in the movie uh will it Dr. Willett sets it up when he's explaining to Charles Dexter Ward, who uh, that's Vincent Price. When he uh, arrives at this place, he explains, you know, the, well, your ancestor was into this stuff and they had this book called the Necronomicon and they were trying to summon Cthulhu and Yog Sogoth and they were conducting these experiments and doing all this crazy stuff. And then at the end, there's a bookend where when uh, Joseph Kerwin is back and he's basically like, we began a great experiment, you know, and this is what we were trying to do by basically in that scene, mate uh, human women with, uh, you know, the whatever, whichever one of Lovecraft's bestiary lives in this pit at the bottom of the, uh, the haunted palace. Yeah. <laughs> okay, gotcha. And there's also... Uh, the idea you see, you know, throughout the movie, there's these, uh, people with deformities, which look kind of, uh, I thought fish like, right. They, they do kind of have that bulbous head and, you know, kind of fish like nose, which I'm like, okay, they're clearly, this is shadow over Innsmouth stuff of the fish people <laughs> right? that they're sure. going for here. Aquatic, uh, horror creatures, um, that have been in the 110 years uh between the the opening of the movie and the 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 present time when the movie takes place uh are the offspring of this unholy union uh, yes <laughs> speaking of uh, offspring um this isn't one of those movies where um <clears throat> like you said there's a cold open sort of that starts uh earlier on that shows Vincent Price um then we go like you said to 110 years later and it's one of those movies that casts the same actors to play the relatives of the people from before and into the, into the future. I like when they do that. Sometimes they cast them differently and whatnot, but they just go the same actor <laughs> in the same spot. Simplicity. Is it confusing say. though? I mean, were you, when you were watching it? Yes. Did you, okay. uh, at the, at the beginning I was confused. I'm like, how much time has passed? Cause I didn't know. Cause I'm like, are these the same people? They all seem to be, they all seem to have the same personalities as the characters that were shown in the cold open. So I couldn't tell if they were like different people, descendants and whatnot. And the movie doesn't, it's like the time period, even though we're saying it goes from like what 1600s to the maybe early 1800s or whatever, you know, like nothing changes. Yeah. Because you're still these and thous and the yees and yours, you know, the buildings are the same. Yeah. 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 And it's like the same people living there. 
So yeah. that's maybe to the movie's fault. Difficult. Yeah, it's difficult to, you know, like, okay, these are, oh, these are the descendants of, but they all look exactly the same and they all, you know, are uh, serving the same function. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, the movie starts here. Yeah, the cold open that Sean was talking about is, I think, uh, because that's not in the, um, that's not in the H.P. Lovecraft story. I think that was borrowed from the Mario Bava movie Black Sabbath. Uh, with Barbara Steele, where they burn the witch at the beginning of the uh, of the movie, and she puts a curse on you know uh, the, uh, on the descendants of you know the people who are burning. Very hocus pocus. Yeah. Yes, I was thinking the same thing. And it all like, goes back to yeah. Focus. <laughs> all, it all goes, goes back, back to, to Mario Bava. Um, yeah. But uh, so he what? But what the townspeople torches all that through foggy graveyards. You know, you gotta have that. Um, they're upset because. Um, women from the town are being hypnotized. Somehow Kerwin's hypnotizing them and luring him to his, his haunted palace where he then takes them down in the dungeon, <laughs> chains them up and, uh, they are attacked, presumably impregnated by this, uh, you know, green scaly thing. We don't see that until the end of the movie, but that's what's happening. No. Right. <laughs> Even then it's a warped lens so we don't really get a good look at it it's because of the power of the thing sean it's war distorting the <laughs> you lens. can't even look right at it <laughs> <laughs> that's power right that's good. people people don't even look right at me that's power yeah you can't see me yeah um but yeah so they burn this guy alive and then his descendant arrives in the town with his uh lovely wife uh that's uh deborah paget playing her deborah paget um is of note uh to us here at the saturday night freak show because her first movie was a movie with james stewart called broken arrow oh damn that's a callback um wow. <laughs> yeah she was also in the ten commandments yeah she was also oh, in okay. uh with uh, vincent price in the roger corman uh post series she was in uh, trilogy of terror yeah, I've heard her name before in some noir movie. Um, yeah, Michaela actually brought up uh, as we were watching this and just looking at Deborah Paget in this movie, uh, the movie, the, the recent movie, The Love Witch. Um, I noticed that you you mentioned that right when I, around the time that she showed up. What was it that like um, inspired that? I, I was commenting on uh, every woman in this in this movie is wearing like the trademark '60s peach lipstick. Every woman back then wore like Audrey Hepburn had that peach lipstick in like every movie she was in. And Michaela thought about the love witch. She's like, you would love that movie, which I have not seen it, but <clears throat> it looks say, just like all this. Yeah, it is. It is a slow burn of a movie, uh, but I feel like you don't really notice it as much because every scene is so like painterly and beautifully done. Mm -hmm. And like, it's just like the aesthetic of that movie is unlike anything I've seen since the sixties. So mm -hmm. definitely worth watching for that reason alone. Well, yeah. I remember sure. um, Anna Biller is the director of the love, Witch. she was talking because they shot that movie on film, uh, you know, after we had made the, you know, move to digital um, because she was trying to replicate like, this very specific sixties uh, lighting scheme is going into the weeds, I guess. But like, I guess what she was saying was in the sixties, the way that they would light, especially women, um, they, regardless of where the uh, light source was supposed to be, right. Which is kind of what we do now. It's like, well, we have to motivate the light source. It's coming through that window. Right. So this is the kind of light that you would get in the sixties. It was like, regardless, we don't care if it's coming through the window or not, we're going to light, you know, the actress. So she's beautiful. <laughs> you know, that light's coming right through that brick wall. Yeah. 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 It doesn't matter. <laughs> it can't be a light over there, sir, but put it there anyway. Cause she, she looks great. <laughs> yeah. And it's this kind of like glamor. Um, you know, it's like sixties glamor that you got in yeah. all the movies of Alfred Hitchcock and, uh, you know, these, you know, it's just the way that I think that, uh, that you did stuff. Yeah. Um, Cause if you, if you up the lighting enough that the contrast is really high in the image, it kind of distorts your, features a little bit so that your skin looks smoother and your face yeah. looks more defined. And that's, I mean, that's what filters do now. I was, I was going to say it's like the original filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. And back then actresses would have like lighting crews that they would put in their contract to be like, if you want me in this movie, you have to hire this person because they light yeah. me the way I want to be lit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
it's interesting i mean that's why i think it's cool when you know um I mean, it's a nostalgia thing, but I like it when new filmmakers kind of try to replicate, you know, it's like, well, you got to get in the headspace of how you, how they created this. And this is a specific, you know, cool, um, forgotten technique of, you know, of doing this stuff. Um, Alan, you need to uh, talk to your lighting people. You yeah. Right some. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need some, it needs some work. Well, well, we always do these things on zoom. I'm in a basement and I have a, uh, I've got a, uh, you know, camera on my computer like everybody else. But for some reason, mine looks like shit. <laughs> it's because you, you have to... a light right over your head like that. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you need a, you need, you need one of those influencer ring lights, Colin is what you need. Yeah. Right, right, those right, are right, pretty right. great. Yeah. Yeah. Do you just click yeah, on the front of the, the camera, yeah. the webcam? Oh. Yeah. Colin's lighting looks like he's in a police interrogation room and there's one single bare bulb above him. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there should just there be is. like a half lit cigarette in the corner, slowly smoking. <laughs> because there is a bare bulb above his head. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to work on that. Um, so a yeah, nice diffuser, right? Um, sorry. You can't see this at home. We've posted pictures of this before. Like guess <laughs> yeah. which movie genre each one of these, uh, boxes are. Okay. So, um, so, uh, Price's character moves to town and the characters all, of course, instantly dislike him. Uh, you know, the townspeople is 110 years later. He's Charles Dexter Ward and he's inherited, uh, this castle on a hill. I want to inherit a castle on a hill. I swear to God. I, mean, I was going to say, does this know. happen anymore? <laughs> right? Does this ever happen? <laughs> but isn't that what some wait, long uh, lost relative dies? And yeah. like, we leave right. you. Yeah. When's the last time this home. happened? Texas Chainsaw 3D? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, oh, it did. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But no, like, not even no, just yeah. like inheriting a house, but like a castle in another country. I was going to say, this happened in 13 Ghosts. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's very true. That's true. That's yeah. true. This is a good staple true. of the horror genre. It something. is. It's like this long lost <laughs> uncle I never knew left me money. Yeah, that always happens because we all Except hope that somehow yeah, right? yeah it'll happen. Um, Seriously, at this point, if a relative left me a house in another country, I'd be like, ah, psh, sell it, burn it down. I don't care. I'm not going. Are you serious? Well, this wasn't another country. This was like Massachusetts. It was Arkham. I'd be, uh, a I'd be like, hell yeah, free pass out of this country. Get me the fuck out of here. Me too. Yeah, gonna but in die. this, they all going to die. Just Fine. for the record, though, they are in. They are still in America. This is they, they just moved to Massachusetts. <laughs> Bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> that Arkham, Massachusetts. In America. This yeah, looks yeah. nothing like <laughs> America. This looks like Eastern Europe hardcore. Well. <laughs> It does have that kind of because they got the old. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they walk past Patriot some hats, at some you know, point. whatever you call it. That the uh, the uh, I was going to say the Yankees. That's not true. That's later, earlier. The uh, like uh, civil, you know, back in the the Revolutionary War hats. You know what I'm talking about? They're uh, not the red coats. Damn it. Anyway, George Washington hats. <laughs> like the tricorn, like the tricorner hat. Yeah, when you see in the bar, because uh, I love it. They got the Burning Man bar, right? Because it's named after the the fact that they burned Kerwin. Burning sure. Man bar. The bar is always like that's like where you go. That's the nightly news. You go there for gossip, and you hear what's going on in the town, and then you go back on your fishing boat. Because at the beginning of the movie, uh, when they're showing us the street, because that's the whole town is a street, you know, fog covered yeah. street. You can hear. Uh, like waves lapping against the shore. I'm like, oh, right behind the camera is the ocean. Mm. That's what they're going for. There's a boat, you know, in the front. Okay. Um, I did not. I did not hear the fishing ocean. village. The, yeah. Okay. Um, so the they don't like the fact that he's the, that he's come back because uh, in this telling, you know, it's like, well, we know he looks exactly like um, Joseph Kerwin, that warlock, but. Uh, Dr. Willett is the like, um, well, how would you describe him? I mean, what's, uh, what's his character like in relationship to the other townspeople here? I mean, he seems to be the only one that's just like, bah, give him a chance. Don't, don't be paranoid about all that ancient shit. So he's like the, he's like the least superstitious of them. Right. Um, probably just, yeah. because he's a doctor, we assume that that means every, everybody else hasn't really left the town, but he did at some point to get, you know, education and, you know, be a doctor and right. came back. Uh, even though he's basically his ancestor was here, you know, a long time ago. Um, Is he a surgeon actor. barber? What's that? Is he a surgeon barber? <laughs> the surgeon. 
I'm, right. Is he a cop bartender? Like right. does he cover all the bases? <laughs> That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like Silent Hill, right? Like you always have to have the town elders and the, the you know, you gotta have like your the the people who are responsible. You gotta have your judge, your mayor, your doctor, and your constable. This town has a doctor. There's no one to stop the uh, hideous acts of barbarism that take place later. <laughs> Crime goes on. No I, I saw a whole town with torches. Well, I suppose, right? Yeah. The mob yes. eventually rises up against the, <laughs> the you know, it's against like the monster. Yeah. What you have to have? Because it's a gothic horror film, I guess is what they're going for. Um, yeah. So in this version uh, well, this is the other thing too. If you uh, if you inherit a castle and it comes with Lon Chaney, um, that might be like your you know uh, uh, clue. Is that a deal breaker? <laughs> his, his green face is a deal breaker. Yeah, what's going on with that? Uh, he's been alive for yeah. a long time. Well, what's his story? Like Who is he, and what's he what's he doing in this? He's the caretaker. <laughs> That's okay. all I got. All right. He's, he's the he's the Igor of the of the movie. Yes, he, he's the assistant to uh, Kerwin, and he's uh, it's revealed that he's been working for years to try and find the right body for for Kerwin to come back in. But Kerwin has uh, said no to all those different people until they found uh, Charles Dexter Ward because he is blood. Yeah, maybe there was like some kind of incompatibility or something. Charles Dexter Ward does uh, look exactly like Kerwin. There's a giant uh, portrait. This is what the whole movie hinges so around. So is it like is it like <laughs> yeah. a do- is it like a donor situation? Like I can't give you a kidney because uh, we're not compatible. Yeah, on like a metaphysical yeah, I can't level, possess right? Your body. Yeah, the yeah. black okay. magic version of that. <laughs> gotcha. All right. <laughs> Somehow you share my blood. Therefore, right. I can take yeah. possession Enter. of you. Leave your shoes at the door and a blood <laughs> sample on the table. Yeah. Um, well, Willard is basically like he's the guy in the town who's like you know okay you know it's your house and you know everybody's a little bit superstitious but you'll be fine. You should probably leave anyway because it's not a the whole town. You know, there's bad things have gone on here, which is right. the whole like uh, you. Uh, fish people, I guess, that are that are still wandering around. It's like, uh, this guy did it so many 110 years ago. We still hold him responsible and his heirs. Um, yeah. And he gets he gets cornered in the middle of in the middle of the street by those. Indians. That was kind of a goofy scene. It's a little goofy. It's, it's goofy in that it's long and Vincent Price and his wife don't do anything. We're talking about a scene where um, we see slowly out of the mist, right? Out of the corners of this, all these uh, these uh, mutants, right? Begin to slowly advance on them from the four corners of the block. And then yep. uh, there's a chime. And they stop and they turn around and, and walk away. But it, the way they're trying <laughs> like to generate. Like a scene from Resident Evil 4. Yeah. I mean, they're trying to generate suspense and like, Ooh, Oh my God, they're getting closer. They're getting closer. And then like they get called off, but there's no explanation or rhyme or reason. Cause we're not like, is there somebody ringing the bell? That's carrying the way. Right. Does this uh, matter at all? And any, you know, it's Would like, they have killed them. Like, yeah. Vincent Price didn't look too disturbed. He didn't look too scared. Yeah. What no. would have happened there? I, I don't know. But, and that's where I'm like, I think there's a problem with the, the writing. That scene exists just to be ghoulish, but there's no real rhyme or reason uh, for right. it to exist. And those effects exist to not be seen on Blu-ray. <laughs> That's true. We're looking at yeah. stuff. The makeup is, uh, you know, obviously it, it looks uh, caked on uh, people with yeah. no eyes. And, you know, it's you just can not see blended edges. very well. Like yeah. you can see the rough edges of where they patched it all on it. They would have just like kind of smoothed it out a little bit more. It would have made a big difference. Well, even um, the uh, makeup that they, they begin to apply to Lon Chaney looks uh, gray. And so does uh, Kerwin also has like another henchman. These guys have uh, 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 supposedly because of the secrets in the Necronomicon, they have discovered how to live forever. Right. And have been Mm -hmm. waiting for their master to return. Um, But yeah, even his uh, makeup was like, are we supposed to be seeing it that gray or is this the, you know, color timing on the transfer that we're looking at? Would it have looked like this in a movie theater in, in 1963? I don't know. Uh, yeah, you know, that's that interesting. Kind of looks mean, like I, Gray Hulk. Yeah, I was gonna say I feel like it's intended to be like that, to be ghoulish. I think just um, as like a modern viewers, it doesn't pay. It doesn't play like it would have back then. Mm, mm-hmm. That's what I think. I don't know. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you watching this movie, you can tell a lot of stuff doesn't play exactly. Obviously it won't play exactly the same now. Like when they're walking through the castle and uh, they see two rats and it's built into the movie. Like it's the scariest thing in the world. Like fucking rats. And it's just like, Oh, Oh, there's rats. Like Like, certain things were going to be big back then. Not so big now. Yeah. When you guys were talking about the acting too, what were you, what were you meaning uh, that it was like heavily dramatic? Um, yeah, there was there was a scene at one point when Vincent Price first looks at the portrait of his ancestor, and <laughs> he's just he's just very much like giving it like the big the big eyes, like the big like what am I seeing, like horrified eyes, and it's just yes. very dramatic. And I was saying like, do we think that? back then they were just playing it over the top because they didn't understand how people were supposed to act or were people just that dramatic back then i mean like, for that I, scene i i personally want to believe that in the 60s everyone was just <laughs> super dramatic all the time i would love that that would be great that would be good yeah right well, I suppose that's why we call this scenes. melodrama, right? Is that well, yeah. is that what it is? Melodrama. It's like, okay, you're really playing heavily into the, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> the drama of this. It's big. It's like so, stage acting almost. Right. Well, so he's trying to get across that this is the first time he's being entered by the ghost I of yeah. I, I did like it. it. I said it on like purpose. That. I said it on yeah, purpose. Yeah. Why, like why are you guys doing that? <laughs> <laughs> by the by the ghost of Kerwin. <laughs> Like, this is his first time. How'd you think he did as far as, I mean, as an actor conveying that he was two different people? I mean, did you know when he was Kerwin and when he was Charles Dexter Ward? Yeah, yes. for the most part. Yeah. How did, what do you think, as an actor, what did he do to distinguish the two? Well, Much I happier mean, there was, is yeah, there was, there was, flam- there was like deep, dark Vincent Price and like flamboyant Vincent Price. You could tell in the voice alone, let alone the facial expressions. Yeah, uh, deep dark Vincent Price. You only see in profile. He's always just like, mm. Whereas happy, Vincent, happy Vincent Price. You see face on, and he's and he's much happier. And I thought he was doing like sad eyes whenever he was, um, you know, he you know kind of, uh, you know, he did that thing with your eyebrows and kind of looks like you're sad, you know, all the time or like bewildered or like a little puppy. I don't know what's uh, happening when he was. Uh, this is. I think you're revealing your uh, feelings for Vincent Price a little. <laughs> A little <laughs> much there. Like he just looks like a little, little, looks puppy, like dog. A little puppy dog. And then when he's, <laughs> he's just Vincent, so cute. And when he's uh when he's and Kerwin, he's then he's all you. yeah. Then he's Vincent Price, you know. <laughs> yeah, then he's more of a dick. Yeah. When he's or when he's uh uh yeah, when he's Kerwin, he's more of a dick. He's he's drinking things and throwing them into the fireplace and he's got an attitude and yeah. So his plan is to um you know, obviously to to pick up what he was doing and, uh, you know, begin reimpregnating these women and, you know, crossbreeding, uh, elder gods and, and man. Um, but, uh, the first, so, but he's, he's, um, like he's married, right? He has Ward's wife there who is kind yeah. of like, she's catching on to the fact that like, what the hell is going on? Like my husband's going through these really weird, uh you know personality shifts and there's something yeah. wrong here um yeah all because he's being possessed by the 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 picture so the spirit of of Kerwin lives in the in the in the portrait and is able to like you know reach out and take possession of him but then he fights me and he keeps losing it you know and he wants to eventually take him over completely right he's like take me upstairs quick yeah and and it's got to be rushed back in before he returns to normal it's like a dr jekyll mr hyde thing here's the thing i always think of like you know 60s movies as being relatively um tame uh in their like sexual politics because you know obviously there were uh certain things this one you can't do but right i mean it kind of like i think this is the rated probably right this probably well what are we talking about here well, um, uh, I don't know as much about H.P. Lovecraft as you. Um, there's a seedier side to the man um, I've heard uh, as far as what his beliefs and all that were. Um, I don't know if it comes across. If this expl- I'm going to call it rapiness of Vincent Price if it's explicitly from H.P. Lovecraft. I don't know whose influence made that a big part of it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that th- those scenes don't, like, I don't think he's married. Or, no, he might be married, but, I, like, 
Lovecraft like skips over all that stuff and goes for he's going for like mad you know the the singular pursuit of something that eventually drives you mad. Mm. So this I think is for the movie, but I'm just saying for like 1965, there's an implied the idea that that uh, you know because Kerwin takes possession of of Ward and is basically like you know the wife is there, but he's kind of like you know I don't want to have anything to do with you. You're getting in my way. You know, who are you to question what I'm doing? He's just being a dick to her because he wants to resurrect his paramour from the past, which is a woman named Hester Tillingast. That's a great name. I think that's uh, Mm -hmm. because Crawford Tillingast is the protagonist of uh, From Beyond. Right. I think that's again, I think this movie is just crossing all of these, bringing names in for different stories. Um, That woman doesn't speak a word in the entire movie if oh, i'm yeah. correct hester right it's like I he mean, wants to bring her back but i'm like well what the fuck was their relationship i'm not entirely sure did you see her colin i think oh, okay. we know the relationship do you think and this is a do you think that uh her casting that she looks too much like um deborah paget so there were times when you're like, uh, they look, they look very similar. And I'm not Wasn't sure who's who. Point? Is it? I think, I think that's it is the point. The, I think it is the point, but why not just cast the same actress? I mean, there is points where they're both in the same part of the picture, but you think since they do it with everybody else, they would just cast the same actress to play both. Yeah, he's a black well, musician, mu- that- mu- musician, mu- magician. He could like somehow install her spirit into a ward's wife right if she looks right like imhotep and shit yeah yeah yeah. yeah. what were you saying holly i was gonna say it i don't know it would just be one of those things like it'd be i don't know it'd be one of those things like in back to the future when like the ancestor looks exactly like the character from later on and i'm like why I mean, you're gonna look exactly the same. Like, so, so you find a wife, you look, like you find a wife that looks exactly like your great grandmother. That makes no sense. Like, I love that. That's how? the shorthand for relatives in movies. That's I see, it caught on with one one movie, and everyone saw it. And they're like, "That's fucking brilliant." We have to do that for every movie from now on. I see, it's love always, it. but it's but it's always bothered me. I'm like, right. why? Why would you marry someone that looks exactly like your ancestor? That makes no sense. Well, it's, they don't no. know. It's it's, yeah, just, yeah. it's just it's just fate bringing them uh-huh. those two people together. Yeah, but I don't buy it. I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> the old McFly, whatever you're talking about, the uh, the the like uh, old West McFlies. Yeah, Back to the Future stuff. Three. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or even part part two where they're where they're going back and forth. Right. Yeah. 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 Have you ever been Facebook friends with somebody that marries someone that looks like they could be their sibling? It's real yes. weird. Yes. <laughs> oh. It's really weird. It's you see really it, you're like, ooh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, automatically thinking of someone that Colin and I used to work yeah, with. Yeah. Yep. Yep. yep, yep <laughs> I think yep. I know who you're talking about too. Yeah. yeah. Oh no. Because um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Holly, you should. I don't know this person, but I'm 90 percent sure you showed me a picture once and said, "Don't they look related?" Yeah, I think I did. <laughs> That sucks. Um, <laughs> Tell your friends if the person they're dating looks like they're related to them. Yeah. Jeez. Um, but uh, speaking <laughs> of weird, weird, uh, you know, uh, things that are going on or w- weird relationship things. But yeah, he eventually comes around to the idea that like, you know, this woman's married to me and I can pretend to be her husband. And so it kind of does approach this level of, well, I'm going to have my way with her. And it's like for, again, for 1960, it seems kind of adult for a movie that probably was meant for a teenage audience. It's like the stuff that they're able to get away with, um, you know, kind of, it's not explicit or overt. It's all implied, you know, but in some Mm -hmm. ways, like it's interesting how, you know, they have to skirt, uh, certain cultural morals of the time in order to like, you know, bring this, because I also often think that when I like, when you listen to Shakespeare stuff, I'm like, how do these movies get rated PG? If you listen to what they're saying, this is like hard R. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if you know what they're saying, it's like, Jesus Christ, you know, right. uh, <laughs> you, you just cipher it a little bit. And you're just like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So They're dirty. The uh, yeah. So Cheney eventually, uh, poor sad sack uh, Lon Cheney. Obviously, he was the Wolfman and you know uh, a great horror star himself. I think he was on like a, a career downturn. He never did achieve the kind of stardom of uh, you know of um, um, Car- Karloff or even maybe Lugosi. To, you know, I mean, he had a sad kind of career traje- trajectory too. Uh, mm-hmm. Vincent Price said on this movie they didn't talk very much in. Uh, and Cheney was very depressed. He, he is how he, uh, he, he said he felt like he was depressed a lot on the set. Um, but they That's do, re- they resurrect um, Hester Tilling asked. And so now the four of them, uh, you know, set about trying to get um, um, the wife um, whose name now uh, is, is escaping me. The Deborah Padgett Anne. character and right. Oh, there, no, there's a whole subplot. Sorry. Before we get to the climax of this movie, which takes place in a great big ass soundstage set that I, I kind of love. Um, <laughs> it does. Cause when they meet up outside the horse and carriage, I'm like, wow, sure is echoey outside. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is one where you can see loud. the cycloramas like have, uh, they're, they're clearly drapes or something. You can see the fabric yeah. uh, on the walls is not going to, um, but Beautiful. no, I mean the soundstage of the, uh, the ritual chamber, yeah, you know, yeah. Cause it's a secret room in the castle that leads down into this, uh, gigantic basement, um, you know, with a big yes. pit in the middle and, you know, torches and three, stairs leading up to three flights of stairs to get down. And yeah. we walked every single one of them. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Cause I, I often I was sitting there going like, man, they're like way, way the hell up there. It's like pretty damn high up. And we waited for him to come down. <laughs> <laughs> Happens in real time. There's a sub book. The subplot though is um, Kerwin. Now that he's uh, got the body of, of Ward is taking his revenge on the townspeople who burned him at the stake. That's B plot, right? Yeah. And I like this B plot. It's good B plot. Cause he's got like a list. He's got a list of names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then and then he's so he's just going around like lighting dudes on fire yeah like that's how he gets rid of people he has one of the ghouls attack um whedon i think his name is attack him and they both end up in the fireplace just on fire as he watches the other guy he splashes him with gasoline and then the other guy is match uh, at him. elisha cook oh, uh, junior alicia cook yeah yeah who is who you've seen in like everything um uh, it was pretty nice seeing him in this. Um, I don't think he's made it to the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame yet. I don't think I so. Junior. Surprisingly, he was in Blackula. He was the coroner in Blackula, which we did. Um, mm. But I mean, he's you know in tons of tons tons of stuff. I mean, you, House yeah. on Haunted Hill. He, you know, um, same yeah, side, uh, you know, Stranger on the Third Floor, the noir noirs of the time. Yeah, he's in a bunch of sixty stuff. Yeah. And always like a kind of, he always plays like the exact same guy kind of befuddled, oh, befuddled just, looking, uh, <laughs> you know, he's always got that look on his face. Like, Oh yeah. What's it? You know, I don't, what's he doing over oh, there? I'm going to go back to drinking. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I love that guy. Um, yeah. but yeah, so he's going around killing all those people, which we're saying there's like no consequence at all. Well, I know there is cause the townspeople are eventually like, we know it's him. Kerwin, he's back. Mm, another person on fire, eh? I mm. wonder. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I will rain hell upon you and your descendants. This stuff goes a long way with me. Um, <laughs> it does. He's got some good lines. I will say that. I like Vincent Price. He can deliver a good, you know, a, a line like that. Like only Vincent Price can. Yeah. Um. These movies, I think also too, you know, it's worth mentioning that they were kind of the, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, the Hammer film of England, right? But these were like the American competitors. Uh, AIP, American International, were like the Hammer, they were the Hammer of America, right? And these type of movies were the same thing. It's But I think my allegiance leans towards Hammer because they had the brand name Horror Monsters, you know? Yes. Uh, American International Pictures had... Edgar Allan Poe and then would disguise the fact that they had HP Lovecraft too. And, you know, change the name <laughs> to an Edgar Allan Poe thing and call it an Edgar Allan Poe. Like later when yeah. they, uh, they, uh, I can't remember if they funded or they bought Witchfinder general and they brought it here and they called it the conquer worm. Cause it's an Edgar Allan Poe reference. So they keep it all in the, in the Poe cycle, even though these movies don't have anything to do with Poe, but it's American international and they've got 
Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> right. We'll dress it up a little bit and put it out there. Yeah. Um, well, the movie Climax. ends <clears throat> like I think all great 60s horror movies need to do with everything Burn on it fire. Down. <laughs> Burn it down. Burn the goddamn house down. That's how yeah. it's got to end. Yeah. Um, there is something to be said just about like having a film that ends with a house on fire um, does kind of add this, this little zip to the end of your movie, <laughs> you know, when yeah. it's all on fire and yeah, right. We're like, Ooh, this is emergent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it when they do that. You'd be surprised how many sixties and seventies. I'm not, I'm not surprised. Ends with I know the house I on fire. all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause you're watching them, right? You're seeing those. They all into yes. a house on fire. Um, the whole place burns down um, because the villagers set the place on fire, obviously. Um, and, yeah, it's uh, like a repeat of earlier in the movie. They're all going for it, it is. It's the same people, the same actors going for for Kerwin again. Yeah. Um, they end up uh, because they burn the portrait. They free the or They apparently kill the spirit of Kerwin which gives Ward the ability to take his body back. And so he rescues his wife who's chained up over the pit. Um, and then they escape, but yeah, but we last saw him getting wrestled to the ground by his, uh, his cohorts. And then we come back to him and they're gone. Well, doesn't, uh, yeah, that's right. And we never do find out and what happened to them. No. And the pit is right there and open, but will but it the doctor comes in and grabs him and gets him out. Yep. Right. Yeah. Did they go back to the, uh, whatever they hell they came from and will they come back again in the future? I think we wonder. I think it's live to fight another day for them. Yeah. Well, it's also, uh, one of them downer twist horror endings too, because even though Ward escapes, you know, he's freed his wife and uh, will it rescues him. And it's like, are you okay, Charles? Like, Oh yes, my dear just fine and you're like oh shit per- perfectly <laughs> fine <laughs> <laughs> that was my best thriller vincent price laugh how'd it come off okay pretty good okay that's fine uh, it worked it worked well that's uh that's the haunted palace. Yeah, that's it. Okay, well, I guess so. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, uh, listener, what we're going to do. Thank you for listening this long. We're going to tell you whether or not we recommend that you watch it. We're going to go around the table, the virtual table, uh, one by one, tell you what we think of it. But first of all, we are going to answer some of your mail. And in order to do that, we are going to require the assistance of our mailman. And his name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. Yeah, like a He's patch. Torch. A good job. <laughs> and a killer smoking jacket. Am I right? Uh, he does that. He's got that uh, uh, ankle length robe on, yeah. which is yeah. He's. He's naturally that gray, though. That's not makeup. <laughs> um, well, uh, so we're going to we're going to read some of your mail here. And uh, again, we hope that you'll join the Freak Show family. You can write into us and we'll read your mail if you follow along on Facebook. Facebook dot com slash Freak Show on Twitter at Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Center at freak show at yahoo.com. And you can follow along on Instagram. Oh, we also have merch, Michaela, don't we? Yes, you can buy Freak Show shirts, pillows, magnets, stickers, baby onesies, you name it, at tpublic.com slash user slash Saturday Night Freak Show, or just check our social media for a link. You get underwear? <laughs> I'll look into underwear options. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want- I'd buy some. <laughs> I'd buy some Saturday Night Freak Show underwear. Hell yeah! I should Copy see what the most this. ridiculous piece of merch I can find is. Oh, I'll get a, I'll get some Love Rhombus underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> Bring it on. Well, um, let's see here. Uh, Travis Legler writes in. He says, "Is there any chance uh, that we'll do any Child's Play movies or H two O or either of the Swamp Thing movies anytime soon?" Just wondering. I mean, I mean, if if uh, Colin or Sean start pushing my buttons a bunch, I'll bring the Child's Play remake just to torture them. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, no. Oh, man. 
No. Well then, well then Sean, well you then. should think about what your pick is going to be next week. <laughs> yeah. <to give> you. <laughs> I don't think you'll do that to yourself, Michaela, and I'm going to ride that I, back. I haven't seen it yet, so I don't know what I'd be doing to myself. I don't know. It'd be an point. interesting... I, I'll, I'll make the sacrifice because it'd be a very interesting discussion. Oof. Well, Travis, uh, I just want to let you know that uh, usually in January, we do a listener's pick month. Uh, we usually take some submissions for that going into December, and then we have you guys yeah. vote on it. We watch the four top vote getting movies. So that's coming up. So uh, you might want to submit some of those about yes, the uh, haunted palace. Tonight's movie. Michael Whitaker says Vincent Price and Roger Corman doing an HP Lovecraft movie is the definition of on the nose, but in a good way. I haven't seen this one specifically, but I've seen the other adaptation of the story with Chris Sarandon. That would be the resurrected. Um <laughs> Bill Hainer says, I love everything about this movie, except they misspelled Edgar Allan Poe's name in the opening credits. This has been like a thing forever. Allen is a A L L A N and they spell uh. A L L E N. Uh, about last week's movie, we watched pumpkin head. Andrew Bradford writes in and says, I saw this movie around age 11 and it scared the crap out of me. After watching it, I was plagued for weeks of not wanting to get out of bed at night to turn off the lights on the other side of the room. I know it's, I said it's a cool movie, but I don't think it's aged well at this point. It's still fun to watch it, but it's suited for a Saturday afternoon folding laundry or working on a puzzle. <laughs> ah, puzzle movies. <laughs> pumpkin head. I think it's um, a little better than that. We yeah, all did. So too. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. showed it to the kid. Oh, yeah, what he yeah. think? Uh, kid liked it, so. Yeah, I think it's still fun. That's still a fun movie. He's like, it's cool. I like it. The witch mm-hmm. didn't terrify him? No, it's hard to, like, every now and again, he gets a, a thing where he'll give me wide eyes because somebody's sitting on the screen, but it's hard to, like, scare this kid. I don't know. I'm worried about him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the uh, previous week we watched a movie called The Village. Death by Stereo writes in, says one of my favorites. Uh, X Hull Kiwi says the stunning plot twist wasn't that stunning, and it was revealed too early. Uh, Peter Gatt, oh, we asked uh, on our social media, if you guys are following along, uh, we asked if you remembered that Jesse Eisenberg was in the movie. Peter Gatt said, it's not that I forgot, it's more the fact that I didn't care. And Grant (laughs) Parrish... Well, he wanted to know, do you guys like Jesse Eisenberg? Not particularly. I do. Yes. All right, I, mean, I do like him. Like, I, don't, I mean, I, I guess I don't have, I don't dislike him. I'm just like, eh, whatever. Yeah, I mean, he's have, very typecast. Yeah, he plays yeah. basically the same character. Uh, he's that guy. He is the Jesse Eisenberg guy and everything that you see. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't like him. But Grant Parrish also wanted to know about the village where the color red is the forbidden color. Uh, is there a way to get a pink dress that Bryce Dallas Howard wore without red dye? I still, I, I answered him. I still maintain they only specify that the bad color is bright red. I mean, they don't say specifically what shade of red. So if it's just the bright red, that's the bad color. I think you can still get certain fruits and vegetables that are a purpley red that you can get that pink color. <laughs> so that's going very deep into this, but that's my theory. There you go. Uh, CJ Lewis says, I feel this movie was the tipping point for me in Shyamalan films where I think I'd had enough. Sixth Sense was brilliant. Signs was all right. And the village for me was the yep. That's enough moment. <laughs> he left out. Absolutely. He left out unbreakable. Uh, Jacob Laws says, instead of watching the village, Watch The Witch, even though it's not a Saturday Night Freak Show type movie. It actually has the actors speaking ye old English. Mm, in a very yeah, good I, way. Think, I think there was I a best. Of, I think there was a best of episode that the, the Michaela, you weren't with us yet, but the three of us all picked it for our favorite, didn't we? I think we did. I think so. Yeah, we did talk about The yeah. Witch on uh, what was that? 2017, 2016, whenever that came out. Go back. Whenever it we was, do yeah. uh, these uh, year end wrap ups, the best of, and I think we did cover. The Vitch. The Witch. Yeah. The Vitch. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we're going to go around the room and we're going to tell you what we thought about tonight's movie, Haunted Palace, starting with... Holly! Holly, <gasps> you can go first tonight. What did you think of The Haunted Palace? Um, I, w- I will say that the, it had some good um, creepy vibes. It had some good seasonal vibes. I, you know, I love a I love an old haunted mansion. I love the, the fog and 
I like a, a gothic or a period movie. Um, so it had some good vibes that I enjoy. I do love Vincent Price. He's, he's classic. Um, but I don't think any of that was enough to, to help this movie along. It didn't carry it enough. Uh, I lost interest pretty early in this. I, I couldn't really, I didn't really follow it much. Um, there just was, it just felt like there wasn't really a story to follow. It was like one of those movies where you could leave the room for like 20 minutes and come back and still know exactly what was happening because nothing's really happened. Yeah, um, you could leave you could leave the room when they're at the top of the stairs and come back five minutes later they're at the bottom of the stairs. And right. Continue yeah. on the movie. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I, not not enough happened in this movie to keep my interest at all. Um I don't really know what the point of it was other than other than uh, creating recreating a story from HP Lovecraft. So uh, yeah, I can't recommend it. It wasn't it wasn't my jam, but you know I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the history of what type of movie this is. But I also don't think it was. I don't really think the movie is a horror movie or a thriller of any kind. It was just kind of a drama that wasn't all that dramatic. Besides Vincent Price's face, so yeah, I'm gonna have to pass. Michaela, what did you think? Uh, I think that, like, I love the production design of this movie, like the castles, the candelabras, the cobwebs, the rolling fog, the carriages, like, even when it is very obviously a soundstage, like the atmosphere is really nice. And it's perfect, like atmosphere for this time of year. Um, and I, I mean, Vincent Price is always entertaining, especially like once he gets the crazy eyes going, like you were talking about, Holly. Um, mm-hmm. This made me realize just how good Bill Hay version of him is yeah for sure Uh, because he does the crazy eyes too and they'll like pan in real close (laughs) on him it's it's great um and to like the the genius that about bill Hader is that like he's impressions that there's no reason to have like who needs a good alan alda impression you know like but he has one (laughs) that's how you know he's a comic genius you know um so i was thinking about that a lot watching i was like my god his his Vincent Price is spot on. It really um, is. It, and I, I do like Lovecraft stuff. I do think it's interesting to see how all the, how different people adapt it. Um, but my favorite like Lovecraft stuff is not the stuff everybody else likes. I like Pickman's Model, which is a short story he wrote. That's probably my favorite one, um, which would be like a great like Twilight Zone episode, but it's like not enough to be a full movie or anything. Um I yeah, the atmosphere is great. Vincent Price was great, but yeah, I just found this plot to be a little dull and plotting. So the stuff I did like was just not enough to really carry it over the finish for me. So I'm gonna have to pass on it. That being mm-hmm. said, like I don't feel super strongly about that. I'm not offended by this movie. It's just right. not. It wasn't enough for me. I felt like there was potential there, though. So that's where it's gonna lie for me, Sean. Um, yeah, with, with movies like this, um, <clears throat> for me, just for me, um, it seems like these are all variations on a theme. So when we get to movies like this, as much as we do appreciate, like we've all said, uh, the atmosphere is like top notch. Um, I, I'd love to look at movies like this. I, I, I you know, sound stages and, and, and big castles and the, uh, the smoke, the fog flying everywhere. I mean, that's fun. That's, that's enjoyable to watch. Um, but they are a few things. They're doing the same things in this movie, more or less that they do in, a lot of other movies of this type. So, and again, this is just for me. Um, uh, it's, it's, it gets, when it gets down to it, it's hard to recommend, like, which version of this should I recommend to you for you to watch? Um, it is rather dull. Mm-hmm. And like I said, we watch these people. There's a lot of walking around with music. I mean, they walk around this castle a lot. And it's just like, man, we could have shaved. I bet you could take 20 minutes out of this movie. Just quicken it up a bit. Um, yeah, it's a tad slow. And well, I mean, well, yeah, what do we really get to in the end besides the same thing we got at the beginning? I don't know. I think there's better better versions of this that you can watch that I would recommend. But I mean, you know, it's got its merits. Vincent Price, the atmosphere. I like the actors in it, but ah, it's, it's too slow. You know, I'm, I start checking out at some point. I'm just like, okay. We're still going, still going, still going. We could get there much quicker, um, I think. So, uh, 
like I said, it's got its merits, but I'm going to pass on the Haunted Palace. Not quite. Needs to speed it up a bit. Colin. At what point, Sean, did you realize that we were watching the resurrect the, the resurrected? <laughs> and which one um, did you like better? I don't remember my thoughts on that. I think uh, I would watch the resurrected again before I uh, before this one. It's got some. I think that one's got more monsters and shit in it, doesn't it? Toward the I end, I remember. Yeah, some, there's some monsters more, in the end, more, and they do like more, flashbacks to old days and stuff. Right. Like that, yeah. I don't think we were particularly thrilled with the resurrected either. Um, so it's like. Yeah, so it's like, all right, I got the story. Yeah, I'm I really good. don't remember that movie. Like, I'm looking I, at, I, I, I'm looking I remember at he's, like, images from it right now, and I'm like, I do not remember any of this. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, and yeah, that one has, that's out of my mind. I remember bits and pieces of it, and I know Chris Sarandon and some stuff, but yeah, it's just, it's gone. So, I don't know. I, oh, think yeah, I don't feel like we could do this show if we remembered everything we watched. <laughs> very true. <laughs> you I think we would lose our minds. Like, hey, yeah, true. that's very true. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I guess, um, you know, I was, uh, doing a, I realized that there was a, um, uh, Vincent price deficit in my, uh, filmic experience. Right. And so, yeah, recently I have, uh, this year hit it hard, you know, gone through those box sets, been looking stuff up on prime, been watching a ton of Vincent price movies. This one stood out to me, uh, I think because, I mean, I like it the best of the Poe movies. Other people may like, you know, some of the other ones, obviously, but uh, I think it's because of the HP Lovecraft connection. I, uh, I enjoy that cosmology so much that when I was watching this and realized that that's what it was doing, because I don't think I knew that it was, you know, based on Charles Dexter Ward. Um, Oh, yeah. I first started watching it, and then it was like, oh, based on an H.P. Lovecraft story. And then as you get into it, you're like, oh, I know this story. You know, the, yeah. I, I recognize these names, you know, Joseph Kerwin and, you know, all this stuff. Um, yeah, maybe it is uh, the mood, the atmosphere, um, that whole, um, you know, um, American like witch trial period of, uh, you know, magic and witchcraft and superstition on the, the, uh, Eastern seaboard, you know, that kind of, uh, it's not rural, I guess it's, uh, you know, but it's a very insular, these little insular societies where all this stuff is going on that, um, yeah. And that stuff just appeals to me. And maybe that is why I responded so strongly to it. But, um, I mean, it made me appreciate Vincent Price. I liked, you know, you know, the, the fact that he was trying to do like this. This was a movie that gave him the ability to play different, two different characters, basically. Uh, I think one of his favorite movies that he said is uh, Theater of Blood, which is um, basically it's a variation on uh, Abominable Dr. Fives, but he plays a uh, theater performer who does Shakespeare and uh, he gets bad reviews. So he starts killing all the critics using De murder uh, situations that are in Shakespeare's plays. So a, he gets to be, you know, he gets to be playing Shakespeare all the time and he gets to play a bunch of different characters. I'm like, yeah, okay. I get it. Why you like it. Cause you know, from an actor's point of view, you know, right. uh, that's what, uh, what does a movie, like, eh. but, um, uh, I mean, you know, I get this, this movie haunted palace gave me an appreciation from Roger Corman, you know, and the, the stuff that he's doing in this period of time, these kind of lush widescreen, uh, you know, Panavision technicolor, um, Gothic horror movies. Cause I did think, you know, Roger Corman was like, you know, B movie producer. And it's like, Oh, he can actually like make like a real movie. He, uh, well, I think the last movie that he made, well, he made, he made movies up until like 1970, 71, right? He was a director. And then, uh, then he formed uh, new world pictures. And then he became basically a producer, but in 1990, uh, somebody got him back out of retirement, you know, director retirement. And he made a movie called Frankenstein unbound, um, with, um, not Brigitte Nielsen, Bridget Fonda and, um, who, John hurts in that one. I mean, it's just weird. Raul Julia, I think, <laughs> Yeah, so it's like uh, the the you know twenty five years and Roger Corman comes back and makes a movie and then he vanishes from the director's chair again. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess you know as a student of f film history, horror film history, 
Um, I think it's important every once in a while. It's like, yeah, tonight I was sitting there going like, is this playing well with these guys? You know, I don't know. It is kind of slow. I think the the plot does, um, it spins in circles and it feels like in some cases it keeps coming back to the same plot point. You know, we want to leave the castle. Then all of a sudden I don't want to leave the castle anymore. And the wife's like, how come we're not leaving the castle? And you know, that seems like it takes forever to resolve itself. It seems like we're continually stuck on that, uh, plot point. To be honest, this year, I got myself a 16 millimeter movie projector and I bought a, a red print of uh, the Haunted Palace it was one oh, of the man. first things I found. And it felt like it went faster. And I'm like, you know why that is? It's because you're sitting there hoping that the film doesn't break or something. So there's, <laughs> you're on the edge of your seat, you know, and it, the movie. You uh, have to be to get up and go stop the fire. Shit yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's like, I got to get back there before that thing breaks. And I showed it to my niece and nephews and, you know, they're 10 and uh, 10 and eight, my niece and nephew, and uh, they dug it. You know, they were because we showed it in the backyard on 16 millimeter, and to them it was, but it could have been because it was, you know, on right, you know, the experience. The experience, the experience yeah. Yeah. Um, they like the atmosphere as well. This was actually the first time I've seen it widescreen in color. <laughs> um, um, oh. So, yeah, it was kind of, it was drier this time, but I'm like, it's because I know it. I've seen it like, you know, several times this year. Um, I would, I would still recommend it. Uh, but I'm saying specifically to like an audience who's interested in, um, you know, a Gothic horror stuff of this time period and B uh, people are interested in HP uh, Lovecraft stuff. and want to go back and kind of see like, you know, as a piece of film history, it's like, this is the first time that you do, you know, that they are talking about the Lovecraft uh, cosmology in a, in a feature film. And I think uh, AIP did, um, the Dunwich horror Dunwich Dunwich yeah. horror with Dean Stockwell. That was in the seventies. I thought they did one more, but now I can't remember recall. But then obviously it was like until Stuart Gordon was doing, you know, reanimator and from beyond. And then every person under the sun is making HP Lovecraft movies up until like, uh, you know, maybe is, uh, in the mouth of madness, maybe, uh, one of the best indirect adaptations of that type of, um, you know the concepts of hp lovecraft i don't know but uh, i would recommend this movie for its performances its atmosphere it's uh you know the hp lovecraft cosmology um i thought it was uh, a fun movie so i'll recommend it um but that's that next week we're going to be watching a movie that's chosen by sean what are we watching next week next week we are going to have some campy spooky fun and we will be watching Billy the Kid versus Goddamn Dracula. <laughs> Everybody's head just went down. I'm on the monitor. Like, this has oh, been no. an off mic conversation for a couple weeks now. So, mm. guys, guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It'll be just fine. I, I haven't seen it. Like, Sean, I don't always trust your taste in situations like this, though. Hold on. You shouldn't. Sean. Have you looked to see where it's available to watch? I have. Can we all watch it? Yes, we can all watch it. No, okay. no special apps that we have to download. It's no not gonna be on like commercials we have to go through. To be with it's commercials. Okay. Okay. All okay. Right. okay. Okay. All right. Well, that's next week. We're gonna watch Jesse James meets Dracula. So, I mean, sorry, no, the other one. Billy the Kid versus Dracula <laughs> on the Saturday Night Freak Show. We hope you'll join us. Happy Halloween. And until then, the basement is going dark. <laughs> <sighs>